Hey folks, it's John Reed. Success Factors 2018 is winding down, and that could mean only one thing. Yes, after a one-year sabbatical from the podcast and the show, Jared Pazahanik is back. Hey, great to be here, John. Hurricane Harvey uh, threw a wrench in the plans for last year. Yeah, and another hurricane going on this year, but hopefully no one is affected that we know, or hopefully everyone does all right with that. But anyhow, we're carrying on. So Jarrett is an expert success factors consultant, an independent, uh, payroll obsessed, <laughs> a a Twitter bit. maven, a uh, family man, <laughs> rock and SAP shoe. Uh, gosh, you're a bunch of contradictions, aren't yep. you? Vikings fan as Vikings well as an Astros fan. fan. Yeah, people can always check you out on Twitter where you have a lot of entertaining missives. Some people think you're a Workday fanboy. Do you want to clear that up? Uh, yes. Uh, well, one <laughs> interesting part of that is uh, I make 100%. I always have 100% of my income revenue for the last 20 years has been with SAP customers and so yeah. and Success Factors customers. And so it's one of the areas that I'm so passionate to um, fight, uh, defend, uh, help them out whenever I can because they help me out. And, uh, you know, it's a good two-way street. Yeah, occasionally if someone tells me, like, yeah, you know, Jarrett, he... He's in for work day and not in for success factors. And I'm like, Jarrett, if you don't know, he makes a living on success factors projects. If success factors doesn't succeed, Jarrett's <laughs> it's kind of screwed. <laughs> I find it pretty, I find it pretty interesting because, you know, when some, there's a lot of stuff that I'll say that people will, um, agree with, but they won't want to agree with it publicly. And there's other people that, they, they want to assume that the reason you're not saying something positive is because you have an axe to grind or there's some financial interest right. in it. And, and really, at the end of the day, I'm really just trying to uh, uh, give a louder voice to the customers that I deal with, the customers that I reach out to. I make a point to not only the customers I'm working with, but I try to take at least four to five customer calls a month. I have a lot of people reach out to me, so I really have a really good pulse of what's going on in North America. And I want to caveat that because I do have some friends that have said, we're not seeing what you're seeing in Europe or in other places, and that could be very well true. So it really, when you hear me give any opinion about the Wild West or or something, keep in mind that it's a very U.S.-centric point of view that I have, and, and so there's definitely some bias there. Right. And you can see how some success, success factors fans might critique that just because one of success factors obvious strengths is the global right. presence and reach. Definitely. So, um, so I just want to frame this up a little bit because we're, we're now, we've just been through the entire show. Um, you and I had some shared media sessions. Um, I had some interviews. You had some other things you did on your own. Um, we want to make sense of what we saw, but. But I do want to backtrack a little bit because in the spring you went to an influencer event that I was not at, and you left that event, um, I think, feeling like, I think, kind of impressed with some of the things you heard. And so, it's an interesting contrast to then look, you know, fast forward to today where a few months have transpired and to kind yeah. of, you know, see what kind of fall through is made on that. And one point that you've made that I think is really important for listeners to understand is there has been a, a real shift in Success Factors leadership, right? Yes. So, yeah, pretty so much mean, all the lead executives have turned over in the last, well, from two years. Two years ago, yeah. yeah. So, so success factors is, I guess it's maybe one of those at certain times, uh, keep your friends close, keep your enemies closer. Uh, yeah. I have a buddy of mine, Chris Solomon, who you know, always oh, yeah. jokes that they invite me to some of these things so they can uh, put me down in a boiler room and give me a beating. So that's, uh, that's yeah. the better take uh, on uh, what's going to happen. But no, in all seriousness, uh, I, I really appreciate the fact that Success Factors uh, does include me in these events. They're looking to try to um, make sure that I'm well-informed, uh, make sure that, that the opinions that I have, whether they like them or not, they, any ones that are wrong, they, they want to definitely say, hey, Jared, you're not correct here. So one of the things they do is they uh, send a group of folks out to this analyst event each year. And I'm not an analyst. I'm a practicing consultant. But uh, there is three consultants there, a buddy of mine, Brandon Toombs and yep. uh, Luke Marson. And, um, and I was just noticed when I went this year that it was that eight of the nine executives that we met were brand, were, were new. Several of them were brand new to the organization. Some of them, like Greg, had worked at SAP for many years, but not in the HR domain. So it was a very good set of meetings, a really open dialogue. They were really looking for a lot of suggestions. And so I, I came away from that very, very energized. Um, obviously the event, this is more of a customer facing event. So, um, I wasn't, we were, I wasn't really expecting to get a lot of specific updates on some of the things that they, that they covered. But a nice mm -hmm. thing is a lot of the functionality they show 
at this show was shown to us, you know, six months ago under NDA. So I, I, from the product side, I, you know, I got to see a lot of the stuff several months back. But, but in my experience right now, I think that the product side, the product side is doing pretty well. The product side has grown. I, I don't hear a lot of people that, that say like, there, of course, every SaaS product has, you know, things that people think, think, think it's missing. But overall, the, the product itself, I think, competes very, very well in the marketplace, especially for global customers. I, I believe that success factors has more true global functionality than, than any of the SaaS providers out there in HR. That said, you know, there's a marketing buzz with all of them. So someone can say, we're in 100 countries. Well, we're in 100 countries. And sometimes it's tough for customers to distinguish, you know, who really has what. So that, right. I think that's a real strength of success factors is on the product side, um, which is which is something maybe we wouldn't have talked about two three years ago because there was still a, a lot of uh, growth was needed in some of the products like Employee Central and some of the other ones. So they've really come a long way, and kudos to the product team and and the investment that SAP has made um, to move those products along. Yeah, and I think from a from a communication side, uh, I think I've seen some ups and downs with Success Factors Communications. They have a kind of a separate comms than the, than the communications I deal with with a lot of the major SAP events. But I had an analyst pull me aside after the earlier press thing because you and I had both pestered Greg, who runs uh, the Success Factors unit, with like some pretty fussy questions. And, and he said, you know, I, if you asked those questions at an Oracle event, you would have gotten thrown out. Oh, um, okay. So, you know, that's kind of... A, you know, and so I think there is some willingness... Not, it's not always easy to answer those types of questions, but I think there is some willingness to do so. Yeah. But one of the things that you and I, I think have talked a lot about is how that type of dialogue, it does need to translate into execution, right? Like, right. not that they would necessarily act on everything that you would say, but there, there needs to be an element of, of how that follows through, and I think that's where the interesting issues come up in terms of where success factors is going right now. Right. I mean, I so, think in a few areas that... that there's some really good stories to tell, and I, I don't think that SAP, SAP or Success Factors is telling those stories the right way. So there's good news out there that customers don't realize because they're not telling anyone. And one of the things that really jumped out to me was that, and, and we had a chance to meet Stefan Reese, and he was did this. He was excellent today at this keynote, as the closing keynote as well. But Stefan Reese is the CHRO at SAP, and. What they have done over the last two to three, four years is they've done a huge transformation, and they've pretty much taken all their SAP HCM software, um, which they conveniently sometimes don't mention, and they've replaced it with success factors. And they have, a, and they're they're a very leading edge, progressive success factors customer. So he talked today that I am the Formula One test test driver. I think is how he said it, which is he wants to be in the fastest car, driving the fastest around the track. And to me, I really like that because I could tell from 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 um, just meeting him that he strikes me as someone that if he sees something he doesn't like, will give immediate feedback on that. So it's and he had a lot of proof points and data where he was saying like he was explaining all these gains that they were getting out of moving to success factors. And uh, I asked ninety five thousand employees. Yeah, ni- so and this is this is ninety five thousand employees running right. pretty much every product that success factors has. And one of the things that struck me is. Why isn't SAP figuring out a way to have him speak to SAP HCM payroll customers? Because one of the issues mm-hmm. they have, John, is they have 12,000 SAP HCM on-premise customers. They have 7,000 payroll customers on-premise. They need to get cloud religion. And one of the things I've been, for the last three years, I've been pushing at uh, the leadership is, you need to figure out a way to get these customers at an event like this. And not only just explain some of the, the newest stuff that we saw, because that's, that's light years away mm-hmm. for some of these customers, but to hear a guy like Stefan Reese talk about his journey and some of the gains that he had moving from the software they had, which was SAP, to success factors. And I think that will, that will resonate with some of those folks there. And, you know, you come to a conference like this, and, and what you realize is they didn't mes- mention SAP HCM once. They didn't mm-hmm. mention SAP payroll. These are loyal, maintenance-paying customers, and they're not here. They're not hearing the message. They're not hearing all these good things that are happening. And I right. think what happens is when it comes time for them to, you know, to look at their next software solution, some of them are bringing the competitors into, into the table, rightfully so. And then that's when success factors does the right. real push to say, 
treats them as a prospect, but what's the best time to treat an existing customer is when they're an existing customer. Don't wait for them to have one foot out the exactly. door. Right, and, and I think that is an interesting dilemma with this event, right, because it's unabashedly a cloud HCM event, and that's what it's for, but folks like you and I, we're trying to think about all the customers and try to account for all of that, and so it's a different type of messaging that's needed uh, there. At, well, at the end yeah. of the day, they don't have another event. So they have a, they have a cloud event, but they don't yeah, have an yeah, on-premise yeah. event. So you've got this large customer base right. that's sitting out there and no one's talking to them. And I, I'm, I'm, I understand that you're not going to be investing a lot of dollars other than keep the lights on for those, for those customers. But again, they are, they are a highly profitable group of employees for, for SAP right now. And they need to figure out a way. And I think having someone like Stefan Reese, uh, through maybe it's webcast or, or mm-hmm. I'm not sure the format, but some way where a message like that, I, and other customers that are like that, cause we saw some here that have moved from on premise. That's what they need to do to get these customers um, moving because, again, some of the deadlines are coming on ERP. You know, we hear 2025 and some of the other dates are out in stone, and there's other options in the marketplace that they're talking about. But, again, it, these dates are coming, and, mm-hmm. and, and I personally think the software, the success factor software would help a lot of these companies. It's just a question of how do you get them re- re-engaged with SAP? How do you get them seeing this new stuff? And, and how do you start that journey to get success factors on the roadmap? Right, because I think that message is only going to work if they can. I mean, I think being able to show some of the results SAP is getting, and, and he and Stefan spoke, I think, fairly like uh, powerfully to some of the results around the real-time data they were using and the changes they were making as a result of modernizing. Right. But also he and his team would need to talk about what some of the challenges were sure. and sort of demystify the whole process of right. what they went through. Um, and and it's not just about, oh, they were on H- H- SAP HCM. It's process and people, how they changed all that. Right. And I think that is a very memorable story. And I, I just wrote a piece where I made fun of, of vendors that used themselves as a, oh, we're a customer. Like, And I think putting someone like that on like a panel is really cheesy. Like, oh, you're a customer too. But I think in this case, like, it really would make a whole lot of sense for them to put that story. And they, they, they say they're doing it, but, but I think I hear you saying that you, you wanted to up the ante with that. I mean, they said they were doing it with prospects. But what yeah. they didn't say they were doing it is with 12,000 right. customers, some means there. And I will say that I don't think it would work depending on who was giving it. And I think that you and I both saw Stefan Reese in action and he struck, a, I think he strikes the right tone, uh, uh, of, of honesty uh, and information and, and really uh, being able to communicate that very well. And, so and that, some humor. He cracks and some, some jokes. humor. And, and uh, um, you know, I have to say, like, you know, just just in terms of that, I was really surprised because I thought he did okay in the, in the briefing that they did with us. I had some problems with that briefing because they didn't start taking any questions until there was, like, about seven minutes, <laughs> ten minutes left. Um, that wasn't so great, but... When Stefan went on stage today, I thought he was dynamic. I mean, Kick, he, he yeah, was knocked it out of the excellent. Box. And, um, and, and, you know, that's the really interesting thing, I think, about success factors as a, as a company and how SAP is positioning it is that the overall vision, I think, is resonant because they speak to, they don't just speak to, like, like, like technology. They speak to things like, well, wellness and wellness at work and diversity in, in a way that I think is actually genuine. I don't think it's BS, but then you do have to connect the dots for people, right? You have to provide them with, with the journey to get there and, and, and how are you going to get right. there? And, and that's the part I think where I hear more criticism from you. And I want to get into the whole wild west thing and what you mean sure. by that. Um, but before we do that, let's just, let's just help people to understand like, like in terms of what happened here, we're not really talking about news stuff because there really wasn't a whole lot of a whole lot of news announced. There was an analytics right. announcement, um, sort of a next gen analytics thing powered by SAP Analytics Cloud. Another nice long name. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> where they're they're combining um, reporting, um, planning, and analytics into one solution, but that that's still in a pretty early phase, and they're right. they're starting to work with some beta customers. Right. They announced um, the chat bot, you know, the whole chat, being able to chat to your HR, being able to chat in the computer. Yeah. And, you know, that gives that's a great example to something you just said is these on premise customers. And I, I'm not going back to that, but even some of the success factors yeah. customers are so far away 
from an organizational standpoint, from a, you know, to be able to roll out that type of technology. I, I, and, I, and I get the fact that success factors to keep up with their competitors has to keep thinking what is customers going to be needing two, three, four years on, down the road. But I guess my, I'm torn sometimes and probably biased because I'm dealing with some customers that want to be very progressive, but I also have customers that are 20 years back in their journey. And when you see right. where, what, what their goals are, it is so much different than some of the news announcements we heard here. Um, right. One announcement we heard here that I found a little bit fascinating is the fact that success factors internally, SAP internally, was the largest success factors mm-hmm. on EC on HANA customer. And I think I saw Luke Marson tweet a little while ago, a couple about a month ago, that 67% of um, customers were already migrated to HANA. But I assume that that meant the smaller size customer. So EC, so success, SAP themselves must have been one of the must have been the announcement said they were the first large one, which I think is a good strategy. Um, if you're, but I think one thing that has to come out is there's been so much hype on HANA throughout the SAP marketing and everything. I think that for their customer base, they have to give a little more explanation as to what benefits they're going to see out of it. Now, I mm-hmm. totally get that it's a cloud vendor. You shouldn't care what database it is, and normally you don't. But the fact is when you've heard your other colleagues in finance and ever, ever place and every product you've bought has the word HANA on it, you, you have some, I think some of the customers have expectations. And if there is going to be no cost savings, because I don't believe there's any cost savings moving off of Oracle for the customers, I'm sure there is for SAP, success factors and SAP, are there any tangible benefits? And we've had some briefings a year ago back. It was something like 5% would run slower, 10% would run mm-hmm. faster, and the rest would run quite the same. So that's not really a, a big story to tell, but maybe over the last year that they've improved that. But the press release didn't mention anything. And we, I wasn't in any meetings or conversations, or there was no other mention of that in any of the things I heard. I don't know if you did. No, I didn't really get into that too much. I mean, I got into it a little bit with a partner that I talked to, EIR, because they specialize in compensation and they've been and and extending that onto the uh, SAP cloud platform. And I think that's one of Success Factor's greatest strengths. Though I don't think they always emphasize it as much as they could. Um, But she talked about how for her running compensation on Hana through the cloud platform was eye opening because some of the some of the performance issues they've run into there have been a problem. Now, I don't think that's true across the board with all HR processes and all situations, right? right? But for her, it was a bit of a revelation. And so those are the kinds of stories that that, that SAP needs to make, right? Because, um, you know, just to say that you run a cloud product on HANA doesn't really do much for the customer. Right. And so to be able to say, well, here's what, what that's really going to mean to you, uh, and, and hopefully to show them. Right? I mean, that's the big thing is to show them. I mean, I think one of the things is they did definitely had a head start on the whole, you know, app marketplace, app store. I think that they've had some ups and downs with that as far as I think they've left some of their partners out on an island and let them go evangelize uh, some of these things. And some of them have done, you know, an excellent job with that. But but at the end of the day, you know, now the competition workday is coming out with their own version of this. And you know, and ADP and some other ones I've heard from some of my analyst buddies really have a, a more robust ecosystem. So it's one of those areas where, you know, if I, I, I work only in this world, so I'm like SAP has this great head start, but the head start, you know, when you, when you think that they had 100 apps at launch and they have 160 now over two years, I, I'd like to see that number be bigger. But I do think that the fact that, that they have the technology and the, inf- the structure in such a place that apps can be built on top of their offering in such mm-hmm. a way that's not changing the code of that offering. Um, if you have more smart people thinking of ideas, it can really extend out the software in a way that um, wouldn't make financial sense for SAP or for success factors to ever do in some areas. Right. A lot of emphasis on mobile adoption. They have some numbers on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that we heard some some good stories about Android. It sounds like uh, for, I know yep. I know my buddy Chris Payne, uh, who you know as well, seemed yep. pretty excited, and I consider him sort of be a bit of an expert in that in that area. It's not it's not a place that I a field that I play very much in. I will say I, I don't ever see any HR people doing HR tasks on a mobile phone where I'm at. Yeah. But, but maybe that's uh, indicative of the customers that are hiring me. So they're, yeah. uh, but I, the technology looks great. I mean, they did. Amy did a good job on some of the demos. It was all from a mobile phone. So you can see that Success Factors is really looking at at a mobile first. And and I think you know, with obviously the millennial workforce and you know, e- even old dogs like me are using the phone all the time. So you can see that that's the future. So I, I really think they're 
they're headed in the right direction there, and, and the, everything I saw on the mobile phone looks excellent as well. All right, so let's talk about the Wild West. <laughs> the Wild West of, uh, you call it the Wild West of Success Factors Consulting, is that it? <laughs> yeah, that's a, bit of a, that's a bit of an unfavorable nickname that uh, I think some <laughs> of the folks I ran into here were, are not too happy about. But, but tell, tell us about why, why you call it that and what's the issue. Yeah, so one of the big things is I think that, as I mentioned earlier, I think that their, the product is on par with their competitors. And in some areas, I think it's, it's above Areas like, I mean, areas like learning and performance management, I mean, they, they're industry leaders in, in their area. And I think even something like Employee Central has caught up to the competitors, which is phenomenal. I think one of the areas where, where Success Factors has struggled is on getting customers live and getting live, referenceable, happy customers. Now, that seems like it should be pretty easy. You know, we're moving to the cloud, the software is easier, there's less buttons to push, you know, there's less ways to configure it. But, but what I'm seeing out in the marketplace is some of the sins of, of a sales for, a sales first organization, uh, where, I read an article a little while back where SAP said their goal was to hire, was to bring in 500 new partners a quarter. And, and, and through that article, it mm. talked about being, they were a partner first organization. And I couldn't help myself but to go out and put a comment, and I said, I think you meant to say you're a customer first organization, right? Uh, and, you know, I got maybe a little bit of a bad response back to that. But, but at the end of the day, I mean, when you hear Bill McDermott up on stage, he is talking about the customer. And so the issue I have there is, is that that mentality of we want more and more and more partners to grow sales, unfortunately, has come into the success factors world. And selling and delivering are two different things. And some organizations can, can balance that off. They can sell and mm-hmm. deliver. But, uh, what I found is that, that there's a lot of, it, it's a bigger problem in the fact that there's so many partners in the ecosystem, it becomes a lot of competition with themselves. Um, and, and, and there's, you know, the certification, uh, it, for the folks listening here, the certification is an 80 question multiple choice test. Those are your barriers of entry. You have thousands of consultants who have passed a, consultants, and I use that term lightly, that have passed a test that never have, they don't have any experience. Well, and where the, you're compa- opening a, <laughs> An old scam yes, uh, for me, Jared. Certification oh, five. Come on. But I was going to say, so where where the issue where that magnifies itself is when you take that and then you put the, the heavy competition in the marketplace, SIs can't, comp- they have to compete on price. And so when the price gets lower, what happens is you don't have a way to mentor your employees. You can't have two paid consultants on a project, one that's learning. And ultimately, these are things that impact customers. So what I've been trying, what I've been doing over the last I, I first spent six months working with the partnership team here. So what a lot of people don't realize is virtually on every issue I'm public on, I try to be pri- I try to be private. I have conversations with success factors if if they if they want. I try to give them guidance. I, I mean, again, there's you know I'm giving my, them my opinion on the ground, but also my opinion is based on working with customers, talking with customers, talking with friends who deal with other customers. So. Mm-hmm. Um, and I want to give them a chance to work some of these things out. But in some of these areas, some of the leadership, it's it's a tough ship to turn. So mm-hmm. I, I totally get that if you've been doing something one way for 10, 15 years, like certification, like partner partners are driving sales, it's hard for success factors to change change that mentality. But where it's hurting them at the end of the day is they're struggling to get customers live and happy and referenceable. And I think, and you, you and I both know, the best salesperson here at this show was not anything they heard on stage. It wasn't anything they heard mm-hmm. at a at a at a, a vendor led event. Mm-hmm. It was a breakfast, a lunch where they talked to a fellow customer and they said, sure. "You know what? I bought Success Factors last year and I had a great experience. I'm live. I'm getting I'm getting all these performances, things that we we're talking on, like to Stefan Reese about. Mm-hmm. When customers hear that, they're like, now I feel a little a little uh, safer because." What I started to realize a little bit more is when the CIO or the CHRO comes to a show like this or, or says, we're getting rid of our on-premise technology and we're moving to the cloud, the vendor that they choose, they're taking a huge risk personally for them mm-hmm. at their company. And what they need to see is they need to see, I made the decision on buying the software. They need to see it live. They don't have an inf- infinite pool of money to have this implementation go 1x, 2x, 3x over budget or live a, a year or two later, that stain comes on them. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and at the end of the day, this is cloud-based software. 
Success factors controls every person that has access. They know every person that has access. They know when customers go live. They know what partners are working on this. So to me, they're armed with the information. Are they armed with the will to actually make the changes necessary to remove poor performing consultants, uh, to influence partners, to price, the, price it differently so they can do a true mentoring, fix their certification? I mean, can you imagine... If, if I decided today that I wanted to become a doctor and I could take an 80 question multiple choice, would you want me operating on you? Or, yeah. or what if I was a lawyer and well, these now jobs? That's, yeah. Well, now that's an SAP wide problem because their, their certification is very similar to SAP's as a whole. And, you know, that, that actually did bother me a little bit because when, um, when, when Bill McDermott, I thought he had a good line in his keynote about how, um, SAP should be more like success, success factors, not the reverse. Right. And I don't believe in trashing someone's keynote because I, I would like to wait until the event goes on. But what I was really wanting to say was, and I'll say it now, is with certification, you didn't do that. It right. should have. Because success factors had actually figured out more about how to certify their right. people properly at that time than, than SAP education for a large part has ever done. Um, except the, uh, with the exception of some professional level stuff that they have added. Um, and I can speak from experience because I negotiated with the SAP education right. for a long time to, along with some other colleagues of mine to try to change right. that. And, and I felt like as, as success factor certification got swallowed up into the quagmire of how SAP approaches certification to the detriment of everyone involved. And it's a real big disappointment because the idea when you acquire a product is to learn as much like, Definitely. like, okay, we're going to take the strengths of things like HANA and payroll from SAP, right, which they did, but then why don't you take some of our strengths when it comes to right. validating and certifying? And we should be clear that the success factors does have a professional level certification that at least has more teeth to it. What we're referring to is the fact that now they have an associate level like the rest of SAP does that right. is a multiple choice based type of thing, and, and many customers don't even realize adequately the differences between that. Right. Right. And, I mean, SAP has not done a very good job of educating the marketplace on the different levels of certification. Right. They haven't done, the partners, the large partners, have not embraced advanced right. certification. Um, but one of the things is, is I initially, when I got certified in success factors, I did it under the old success factors way, and it was so refreshing because it was a... You had to actually get a workbook. So you had to actually get the requirements. You, and then you had to, you had to configure them in the system. And then you had to do a presentation. So it was a bit of a combination of, I can understand requirements. Like I know where the requirements documents are. I can set them up in the system. And I have presentation skills. And those are all things that typically will make a big difference on a successful project. And when they decided to change this, um, I was very vocal that they were making a huge mistake, and this was five years ago. Your colleague Dennis Howlett had some headline that said, yeah. "You know, success factors firestorm" or something like that. It's still live on Diginomica. It's still live on Diginomica for uh, for another thirty days. So read it quick. Um, but you know, one thing that Bill said that struck out with me is one person can make a difference, which which strikes me as customers that are implementing complex software. And sometimes it's getting that one consultant, that one really experienced consultant can be the difference between success and failure. And let me tell you this, 80 question multiple choice test is a joke at the end of the day. You, you could, and for the type of lucrative Absolutely. jobs that are, that are in success factors, yep. I can totally understand why people want to get certified because some of the, a lot of these jobs pay six figures. So, I mean, you're talking about a very prof- high end professional job and for the customers out there, understand that if you don't vet your consultants, if you don't go out on LinkedIn, if you're not asking for customers that they've been at and getting references, there's a chance that you could end up with a consultant leading your project that just passed an 80-question multiple-choice test. And not only that, I think the passing rate is 60%. So well, you've been tweeting out some ridiculous I, I don't, horror stories is, is maybe the wrong phrase, but like people like posting help messages saying like, I'm a certified success factors consultant and I've never run a project before and now I'm running a project. What do I do? I mean, they are horror, ah. they are horror stories, John, because these are multi, some of these are multi-million dollar implementations and the person being going in there is saying, I've never done this. I, where's the workbook? Like where, where, like, like where, where is the guides that success factors provides? I mean, and so you can imagine if they don't even know that, there's no way they know how to lead a workshop. And a lot of these projects, you know, my buddy Steve Bogner always, 
he does a great job of talking about these projects are part technology, part business transformation. But let me tell you, if you have a consultant in there who doesn't even know where a workbook is, or it's their first project, they are their head is not even above water. They are not going to sit down and say, hey, I don't think you should be looking at this process, or you need to do this, or hey, mm-hmm. i got to tell you the truth. The software is not going to work with how you want that. Let's... Let's go, let's figure that out. Where that comes out is during testing or post go live or at various points, and now you have an unhappy customer. So at the end of the day, success factors can control this. They, I've been pushing them to say, you should have a bare minimum. There should be someone should at least be a one or two projects before they can lead a, 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 a success factors implementation. I mean, mm-hmm. think about it, John. Like even these podcasts. If you go back to our first podcast. It was maybe okay. I was really right. nervous. Now we've done 15 of them. They yeah, are, yeah, yeah. hopefully they're not getting worse. But, but at the end of yeah. the day, I mean, you get better with experience. Why aren't they mandating? Because it's their brand. It's their name. It's their reference customers. And one of the big things, Bill Kudick asked a question, and this was the one that I think yep. he said that Oracle would have kicked us out. But Bill Kudick's question was, customer satisfaction was rated very low on the Gartner survey. And the Gartner right. survey was based on references the vendor provided and they were rated lower than their peers. And, and so it's a problem out there. Specifically, it had to do with the MQ, the magic, the the, magic quadrant. The infamous magic quadrant. The infamous which, magic quadrant. Which I have a lot of problems with, but nevertheless. It's customer um, data, though, at some portion of it. Nevertheless, the, the reason for SAP's um, the got dinged, so to speak, on the quadrant was provided by Gartner was, was customer satisfaction yes. scores. Right. And... Um, the SAP Success Factors leadership team did respond to that question, and they they what they said, and I think we need to represent their views here. They said that they were very surprised by that news, and they also acknowledged to a point the validity of it in the sense that they said, "We think you're going to hear a different story when you come back next year." So what they what they were saying is that a lot of the issues that came out there. They feel like they have already taken big steps towards addressing them. And I think in that regard, you give them a year. Yep. And, and you find out, they say that's a change that they've made. Sure. Let's find out how comprehensive those changes are. And I, and I mean, that's exactly what they said. We've got a, a beep. Sorry about the beeps, folks. <laughs> We're a uh, forklift coming. <laughs> it's, it's kind of hard sometimes at the end of a show like this to find a quiet space and I thought we had succeeded, but. Anyway, you'd have to put up with that for a sec, hopefully to go away. If anyone at Success Factors thinks that this was a problem that they just got aware of at this from the MQ, then that's to me that's ridiculous because I have been asking for the last ten years, what is your customer satisfaction? Yeah, what yeah, is your yeah. customer survey number? There's a reason that that's not provided even under NDA, and it's because the results aren't as aren't, aren't that good. And all I was all I say to them is, even if the results are average then make sure the next year it's 10% better than that. Like, start a trend where every conversation you're thinking, every partner we bring on, are they going to lead a successful implementation? And the ones that aren't, mm. like, just because you're a partner, that doesn't mean you're a partner for life. All, all, these, desig- all these professional you know, organizations, they have to realize that if we don't deliver on time, on schedule, or we're not doing what, holding up our end of the bargain, you're not a partner for life. And so I'd like to see success factors send a message out to the marketplace mm. on partners that aren't doing right by their customers. And they'll come back and say, well, we got rid of 74 partners last quarter or last year or something. But those were, those were consulting firms that didn't have any success factor certified consultants, so they couldn't work anyways. So I just want to see success factors go that next level above. And a lot of their programs now are, we want the customer to do something. We want the customer to do this and the customer do that. Well, these customers buy software every 10 or 15 years. They're not in the business of also then going and saying, oh, I have to do all these other things. So it's like I rent, a, I, I own an apartment building and I'm a renter at the house. I don't, ex- and they say you have to use an approved painter. I don't expect to have to go and take a list of their 10 painters and interview each one of them and mm-hmm. see if they've ever painted before. You know, I mean, so that, that's the mindset is they're putting a lot of stuff on customers that I don't, I think the customers aren't equipped I hope they're listening to this podcast or some prospects and they actually start to do these things. But if customers aren't very savvy and smart, bring in an expert that will help you through that journey. Bring in someone that will help you vet your consultants. Yeah, and don't just assume that because you're dealing with SAP professional services or Accenture or Deloitte, they're just like any organization. They're like your own organization. There's good people, there's medium people, and there's bad people. And if you get those bad people, 
you will have a failed right. implementation. Yep. And, and to be fair to SAP, the advice you just gave is advice that I would give any software, any customer for any software selection, any vendor, and any partner. Sure. You always need to have independent advisors who don't have the right. same sort of stake in the in the ongoing sort of sort of uh, revenue of the project the way the prime vendor does. You always have to have right. accountability from somewhere, right. um, and and I think. Sure. You know uh, that applies almost universally, but it certainly applies in this case. And 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 you know just just also to be fair to SAP on that, I think if someone from SAP were here, I think what they would be saying is, you know, we're going to prove you wrong on this. Uh, that's you excellent. Know? I uh, you know I mean that was the message that sure. I got from them, and and it seems to me that next year's show is going to be a big show for them in terms sure. of being able to show the progress on some of these issues, right? Because they would tell you that. They're already working on this stuff, yep. and that that would be their response to what you to what so, you've said. So a couple things. So, so one thing's a pet peeve of mine is people that like make predictions and then no one comes back like a year later to see if they're right. So I want to yeah. talk about another prediction we you and I made two years ago. But I'll say you know I hope I'm wrong. I want to be wrong. Like I want to come back next year and I want to see them. I want to see them on par with Workday and Oracle on the Gartner MQ. I want to hear more successful customer stories and customer references. Like I this is this is one where. I'm pushing publicly because I want to see positive Jared, change. What would you tweet about, man? I don't, there, there's always something. Maybe you know, maybe the Vikings and Astros. I mean, I love. No, I mean to be at, at, at the, on all these things, John. Like these are good things for customers. I want to see them fixed. That, that's my only goal. Yeah. But now, talking about two years ago when we sat down here, you and I had a bit of a discussion about ASOG had right. just released their partner place, which was going to be. An online vetting of partners, and, right. and I was very—I uh, think we were both very skeptical yeah. that this would. Uh, well, so many firms had already bashed their futures against those rocks and right. screwed up. Right. Um, the idea of partner accountability through some type of ratings or evaluation has right. been a dream of yours and mine for a long time. Right. Um, and and Asa gave it a go. Um, I don't think that program has got much legs left in it. I right. haven't heard. Much yeah. amazed talk about that. Yeah, so I, I checked the other day, and they only they got one. They started with like seven or eight partners, and they were up to like ten partners two years later. So they never got they never got any traction on that. And again, the people that were leading that initiative had the best intentions at heart. But there's just it's a very difficult for any type of organization that's not independent to be able to go out and provide the type of Yelp, you know. Glassdoor type rating, uh, TripAdvisor type rating of a vendor because there's I think for the listeners out here, they'll realize that there's a lot of marketing out there. Mm-hmm. And there's not a lot of people that will say the good, the bad, and the ugly. And sometimes the ugly gets hidden or, you know, and the nice thing is, is, is that, you know, we, you and I both met Bonnie, Bonnie Tinder this week yep. and Bonnie's launching Raven Intel. Bonnie which is, and her partner Michelle. Or, yep, Michelle. And um, they're actually going out and they're actually a truly independent, um, which, what you, what you call them, an independent, um, Rating of partners, based ratings, off research, and advisory right. you know, around partner performance, and they're right. starting with Cloud HCM. It's not specific to success factors. Correct. Um, if Workday, they, Cornerstone, if they get Oracle. Cloud HCM model down, they might expand to other areas. Right. Um, I taped a podcast with them. It's probably not going to be available if you're listening to this right when it came out, because I'm going to do this one first. But I, I did get into some of their data, which is very interesting. Um, I, I wish them well. We need more. Of that type of thing. I mean, customers need more transparency into how to select the right partners. Um, so that's that's an issue we're going to have to right. sort of see. And to your point, like as far as predictions go, you know, let's let's come back see to this it. one next year as yeah, well. Yeah, absolutely. And I absolutely. think the key for partners, I mean, the key for customers is there's lots of sources out there. So you know, don't I could get that you come to a show and you get excited. I get excited. John sometimes gets his gets a smile on his I face. Can. He gets a little excited I can too. Smile. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it's it's good to feel good about coming and seeing these things and thinking how they can transform your organization. But understand that what you see on stage, getting through the procurement process, getting it live so that you can see those those gains it, it is a journey. It is incredibly hard work. Don't ever think that you don't need to put your best and brightest on this. If you hear terms like, "Oh, that just works out of the box," or or Oh, that, that's simple to set up. Step back and say, uh, show me that. Let me talk to three or four customers that have experienced that. Talk to other customers. Do a lot of research. 
Do a lot of research when you're buying software. Do a lot of research on the consulting firm you're bringing in. Just because they sold you the software doesn't right. mean they're the ones you have to go with. Just because they did your on-premise implementation or another thing, that doesn't mean they're skilled yep. to do your cloud implementation. So, And then once you select that partner, interview every single consultant that they want to bring on staff. And, and, and if you have, like, the big thing I see a lot of times is customers bring consultants on and then they start to have this feeling like, oh, I don't know, I don't know if I should trust what they're saying. As soon as, mm-hmm. I, my, nine times out of ten, as soon as customers start to get that feeling that they're not sure if they should trust, chances are they're right. Yeah. And I, I mean, I've really, and that's something I don't think I've ever said on a podcast, but I think customers don't do a good job on getting rid of a poor performing consultant like they would a poor performing employee. And you don't realize the damage that these people can do by staying around an extra two, three, four months. They're not only costing you money, they're costing you time and they're probably, they're, they'd be costing you pain down the road. So if in a perfect world, you, you select the right consulting, consulting partner and consultants on the front side. But if you don't, be quick to act if you feel or bring in someone that can go and vet the work that's been done for you. Um, you know, you don't want to wait to your to your live or in a trouble before you realize it. No, and I and I and I do feel like I I want to see more fire in the belly from more customers, not just success factors customers or SAP, but really all customers are right into for sure. Because what what's changed is that it used to be you had to have the resources and time to go to a show like this to sort of talk to your peers. Now that's at your fingertips. Right. You know, whether it's Twitter or reading Jarrett's feed or reading some Digitonomica stuff or going online sure. and joining a user group or interacting right. with your peers online, like there's really almost no excuse. And I'm always surprised that, that companies don't see more value in poking their head up more to uh, see what's happening, you know? Yeah, I mean, I talked to um, the CIO of a company that I used to work at for several years uh, doing consulting at, and... Um, they decided they were going to move to the cloud and they took uh, their best people from every, one person from every major domain area and they spent one year, which sounds ridiculous. I mean, it was not their, obviously their full-time job, but they were one year, they did analysis, they came to the shows of, of each of the three major vendors here in the U.S. They actually talked to customers. They had to talk to five reference customers for each mm-hmm. one of them. And they, and they got, and a year gave them time to get smart. So I see too many companies that have like, they have a, a big project on the roadmap. But they don't yeah. do any work, and a lot of them are, you know, understaffed, and I totally get that, but they don't do any work before it's time to start to write checks. And to me, if you've got something on the road, if you've got success factors on the roadmap a year from now, that's mm-hmm. great, because, or two years from now, that's great, because that gets you time to come to two of these shows. Right. Talk to customers, talk to, talk to a lot of people, as many people as you can. Start to get educated, because some of the things we're talking about here, you wouldn't think, like, you wouldn't think, like, I wouldn't have, if I was a customer, I wouldn't think that I needed to ensure, Sure that someone was capable if the vendors if the if they were like certified. I would assume that the certification yeah. meant that they were qualified and passed this rigid test because in some domain areas, you know, you pass your bar exam, you know, you pass your medical license. Or my brother's a Cisco CCIE, which is a very very hard certification. Those carry weight because they have some teeth behind them. In yeah. this case, customers, if you're you'll realize through things like this that that's not the case in success factor. So you have to you have to put that extra diligence on. Mm-hmm. If you want to ensure the stronger likelihood of having a successful project, and the the thing I would add for for SAP too, in terms of what SAP accomplished for me at this show, is SAP got me in front of three very interesting customers with with solid use cases, and the things the thing that does for SAP is that you know when you can do that, what that means is now I'm going to go write about those in Diginomica. A lot of people, of course, will check those out, but they're really well-rounded and interesting stories because it's not they're not just technical stories, they're stories of transformation. And I think that's the kind of stories I want to hear because if you just put in some cloud software, you know, it's going to be limited what you're going to get out of it. Right. But when it's tied to a real vision around how you want to treat your people yep. and how you want to change their work lives, it starts to gain traction with me. And then when I ask them, like, how many employees are touching this, and in each case it was either now are going to be like hundreds of thousands of people. Right. One of them was American Airlines, of course, who was also on the keynote stage. So we heard a little bit of that already. Yep. But those kinds of stories go a long way. And I think that's something that Success Factors was able to produce this year. Yep. Um, so that, that tells me that there's some, some really good things going on. Right. Um, and so it will be very interesting to, you know, 
the thing I tell vendors, and there's probably some success factors, people that are upset about what they're listening to right now. Let's just be honest. What what I what I tell them is that like, don't take blowhards like Jarrett and I too seriously in the sense that it comes down to execution, right? right? Like whatever opinion we have in this moment that is inflammatory or frustrating to hear, like like I know for myself, and I think it's the same is true for you, like. Next year, if we see evidence that it's different and it's better, we're going to be happy to right. change the narrative. We're not sitting here saying this is how it's always going to be. Right. So make the changes, make a better story, right. you'll hear a different narrative. And I will say that that's something that we, a lot of us harped on SAP for many years at Sapphire. Where are the customers? Where are the customers? Well, customers are out right away. When we went to the uh, analyst event I was telling you in San Francisco, they brought Mohawk and Tiva, two big customers, two dynamic yeah. leaders that explained their story the good, the bad, the hard work, and they were both fair. I thought, you know, you could tell that if you have committed leadership, that's a big thing within the, your organization. So if I, this customer out here listening to this, you have to be ready to move to the cloud. You have to be ready to make some 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 tough decisions. You have to really be ready to uh, change your business, not in a way that you're changing it that's going to impact the bottom line, but I'm talking about if you're looking for a, a rip and replace and using mm-hmm. the, getting what you had before, you know, cloud, you're probably not ready for the cloud. So... And I will say here they had American Airlines and Tapestry um, on stage. New customer names, more recent go lives. You know, for a few years they recycled some of the big customers over again. Mm-hmm. So you're hearing it again. So there is some good customer stories out there. And, and I think that the more customers can engage with those customers and understand what were the things that were hard for them, uh, what were the things that, that, that made their project successful, um, mm-hmm. I think it's going to be good. And that's one of the reasons I keep coming back to why aren't there more SAP? Why isn't there an SAP HCM track here? Why aren't they re- engaging their SAP HCM? Like we heard, like GDPR, for example. GDPR right. is a solution that's cloud, totally for the cloud. But did they not think, wow, this is legal? We have to offer something for our on-premise customers. They're on their own, you know. And so mm. more things like that, they have to just look at the big picture. We're fixing customer support on success factors. What about your hybrid message you're selling now? You're, so you're, you have these customers that are on-premise for their core, hybrid for performance management and learning, say. They're getting two different levels of support. Why isn't that, why isn't all of HCM the same? And so there's, there's a lot of initiatives that I see cost, that they're doing that are very, very good for success factors. I'm, I, I, I want to see them figure out a way to get more SAP HCM customers engaged. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, and we are running out of time, and I'm I'm not really sure we should really get into the whole future of payroll thing too extensively because we're already 50 minutes into this podcast. Um, I got an update on that. I'm going to be writing an article about it. You and I have talked a little bit. But I know you're passionate about this topic, sure. so I don't want to stop you from saying something about it. But um, you, I've told you a little bit about what I learned. Sure. Um, and unfortunately, I really can't say a lot because everything I heard was under NDA. So I, I, one, yeah. this was one of those ones that I got my news publicly. Uh, two mm-hmm. years ago, Diginomico wrote an article for Mike Etling that was referring to something yeah. coming. And I think last year you talked to Rob Ensling. Yeah. And, and obviously, I know a little bit more than that. But I do want to say one thing, and this, this probably isn't going to make SAP happy. But if you're an SAP payroll customer... Really look long and hard if your salesperson comes in and tries to sell you Employee Central payroll. Employee Central, yes. There, but Employee Central payroll, just for everyone knows, is SAP payroll hosted in the cloud with some better integration. So there is business scenarios where moving for, if you're moving your whole technology stack off of SAP to the cloud, does it make sense to keep SAP payroll alive? Probably not. But for customers that have any type of SAP finance or SAP other modules, Keep your payroll on premise. Bring an expert in to do uh, some real analysis. I've done analysis for about 10 different customers, and there was only one of those 10 that I could find a real business case because you're moving from, keep in mind, you're moving from SAP payroll to SAP payroll hosted in the cloud called Success Factors Employee Central Payroll. So your sales rep's going to come in and he's going to tell you, we got this new payroll engine, you know, and, there, and it might even show you a different look and feel because there's this thing called the payroll control center, which is this new Fiori based look and feel. Mm. You can get that Fiori based look and feel on your on premise. And the reason I, and the reason this is, this is important at the end of the day is it comes back now to the Wild West partner ecosystem is they're treating these implementation as, as, mm. as complete 
re-implementations. So this is different. So you spent, you know, they're treating it as a brand new implementation where it's the same software. So the partner ecosystem, if, if they could come out with a way where you could do these mm-hmm. implementations very streamlined with tools mm-hmm. and this and that. So some people will say, oh, there's this upgrade for success. Yeah. But that's, that's I am going to challenge you on one yeah. thing. I don't really want customers to take any serious implementation decisions off of, off of our podcast. <laughs> that's true. Like whether or not yeah. to do EC payroll or not. What yeah. I would say is, Open, what research. I would, what research. I would say is, is take Jared's views as a way to to critically analyze this problem right. and have someone like Jarrett come in or someone else right. that you know that you trust who understands payroll, have SAP come in, have a couple of partners come in, right. like get the full perspective. Right. Have more than just sales come exactly. in and try to sell you a picture. Now exactly. again don't don't make decisions right. based on a podcast. Yep. Okay. Like let let the podcast spark your curiosity. Right. <laughs> and the reason I tried to say that, John, is that there's only one message out there. The message, yeah, yeah, the yeah, message yeah, yeah, is, yeah. you know, oh, I have buy, no, so I have no problem with it. I just <laughs> want to be clear. Right. Don't just go do something based right. on this. Like use this as a right. use this to inspire your right. inquiry into this topic because that's what but what what I think you sure. really want and what I think right. I also want is inform customers making Definitely. smart decisions. And that's, I will that's the thing. Yeah, and I will say that for on premise HCM and for like if you have on premise learning and performance management, it's a new world in success factors. I mean, to me, the the functionality and the mobile and the stuff you're going to get there is a true game changer as far as being able to make a business case to move. So I'm really just a focus on the payroll side. The other stuff. I've seen very easy to make business cases when companies are ready to move because the technology is just uh, so much more advanced than than the on-premise in most of those areas. And in, in some of those areas like learning and performance management, I mean, success factors is well known as being the best in the marketplace. Well, and I just think in the long so, run... For no more, one should take that as an informed yeah. advice to buy either, right? No, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think in the long run, you know, um, real... What I would call real cloud is is the right way to go for most companies, but at the same time, like even that depends on your IT philosophy and the kinds of skills you have in house and your data center priorities and all kinds of stuff. Sure. Um, but but there is something to be said when you go to these conferences like that are more cloud focused, like this one, and you hear customers talking, like the American Airlines customer, where I talk with him. Right. You, you suggest I talk with him even more about this, how how they're opting into a lot of new functionality in every release. And yeah. and that's that's something every quarter you can't get that on premise with a lot of with most right. systems without going really over the top, and and so these kinds of cloud right. value propositions do carry weight I think right. over time. And you have to be so, ready as an organization. That's a great one. I know we're coming at the end of our time, but you're getting great functionality coming every month. But it's opt in, so some comes delivered, but a lot comes opt in, which means the customer has to say, I want that functionality. But that takes a certain mentality that's different than your on-premise mentality where we'll wait for release number three or let's let's just wait and we'll do it on a big upgrade. You've got the option now to change your business. And some of these obviously opt-in things are defect fixes and other stuff. But but some of these things are true new pieces of functionality. So are you as an organization ready to move at the pace of the software? Because we haven't talked about that, I don't think, very much. But for many years, the software was behind where businesses were. But right. there's no doubt in my mind over the yeah. last five years that the technology is so yeah. much, like when you're talking these advanced workforce analytics and exactly. these chat bots and these, some of these things we saw here, John, is like, I mean, I'm just like, wow. And so the technology, the, the software vendors have done an unbelievable job of pushing and competing against each other, but pushing the solutions available that I think now are well beyond where a lot of HR departments are. And, and I'm hoping that a lot of them can get caught up because you saw in your cases that you talked to is, I think a lot of cus- customers talk about how important their employees are, but they, it's talk. Yeah. When you see some of the st- customers we heard, you could tell that it was part of their culture. It was deep down, you know, it was yeah. built in. And when you have to start to have some of that, and you combine that with the, the you know, the jet fuel of the technology, now you really have a great combination that can really, really move things forward. Well, and what I thought was really cool was hearing these customers talk pretty openly about the challenges they've experienced as well. And that's gold, right? When you hear the whole story and you realize, yeah, this isn't some friggin' cakewalk. Like, this is hard. Right. You know, but but the benefits are also real. You know, and I think that that's a powerful message. And I think, you know, we got, we did get some of that this week for sure. Um, the, The other thing I just wanted to comment on as we close is that I made a decision to go to a closing keynote, which is very, very rare for me. Um, I really don't go to closing keynotes. I just, by then I'm just done. I'm working on content. 
I usually find them extravagant. It's usually a celebrity I don't want to hear. I went to the closing keynote today, even though I we had to walk quite a ways, <laughs> and I knew it was going to be two and a half hours long. That was how long it was scheduled for, which is <laughs> ridiculous, by the way, for a closing keynote. But I went because of Michael J. Fox. I wanted to hear Michael J. Fox. And it, it certainly didn't disappoint. I mean, Michael mm. J. Fox was absolutely brilliant and like just I I thought I just thought he was like it was humbling to be it was humbling to be in Michael J. Fox's presence and to hear his story. Let's just say that. And but but the thing I do want to say and and I it wasn't uniformly great the whole two and a half hours, but Stefan Reese in particular, um, he really hit it out of the park and I and and I thought and, and the guests that he interviewed and stuff and and then and I also thought Jennifer Morgan when she thanked customers that was one of the more genuine like yep. she she sounded like she was almost tearing up and I was like okay that's cool like you're, right. she was like I'm generally humble that you guys are here right. I thought that and I'm thinking you can't that, fake that and I'm thinking like if I'm a customer of SAPs I'm thinking like you know this company cares like they like I think they got that message across, and I was really impressed by that because I'm very, very jaded about these things mm-hmm. for all the shows I go to. Right. I thought they nailed that. Now, now what we've talked about is that you have to then translate that into meaningful roadmaps and quality implementations and right. all that stuff. Right. Like that matters too. Right. No, I definitely it agree. I mean, course. I think Jennifer Morgan and the, the Thrive Program, Ariana Huffington. I just think that even I don't know how it's going to translate to software, but as far as like some of the things she was saying, we could all relate to. You know, I was joking with you is. I used to have my phone by my bed, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night and read a few emails, and then I'd get up and start working at 2 a.m. until I finally retired it, you know, and put it in my office. So there were things like that. She actually tucks it into bed. She tucks it into bed. She's got like a bed (laughs) for her phone. (laughs) But, but, you know, things like that, things like that strike home because they're real. I'll say that uh, Stefan Reese just, just crushed it. I mean, a lot of times I'm, in and out of maybe checking emails Which, and doing by the stuff. Way, by the way, folks, he's the CHRO. CHRO. He's on the board. I mean, he kept everyone's attention the whole time with a combination of starting off with loud music, but just a very interesting... Good music, by the way. <laughs> Effinescence, Bring Me to Life, which is a really kick-ass song. So um, it's awesome. But, you know, he brought the energy and he tied it. What I like about it is he tied it back. He tied everything he was saying back yeah. to software, but in a sort of a, in a, in a lighthearted way, but you could tell the message. So he, he really took the combination of education, how they were doing it at SAP, uh, you know, and then and bringing it back to some software components. But Michael J. Fox, I'm a, I'm a dual citizen. Uh, I grew up in Canada, and uh, he's a bit of a legend in Canada. But when you hear, you know, I'm, I welled up a couple times just hearing some of his Absolutely. stories. And, you know, when just what a inspirational, fascinating um, you know, unbelievable guy that I mean just hearing his story and he's raised a billion dollars for Parkinson's and I mean he's a, he's out there making a difference and you know there was obviously he talked about some of the his, you know he talked about some of his success and then he started to talk about when he found out and and then he started to talk about how more success came from that you know he really took a situation that you know some people would go he even talked about going in different paths and just he did made made the most of it and it was, it was very inspiring for me I mean I loved it he had a real cool comment about optimism too, which I won't be able to quote directly, but it had to do with that optimism optim, optimism isn't a fantasy. It's it's the lack of evidence that it can't be done, you know. Right. And I thought that was a cool way of putting right. it. And it's like, yeah, you know, you know, there's no no proof that you can't. He talked about how when he was 29 and he got diagnosed, and he was told he had 10 productive years of of his career, and now he's 29 years later. And, you know, one of my pet peeves is when they try to do some hokey, tie some HR around some motivational speech, and they didn't do that because there was enough in there already. Everyone could walk away with something that I think from that speech that, that... that inspires you, and I and I think that that's that's a great closing keynote given the theme of HR and human. And I was I was really really impressed with how how things ended today. So kudos to the Success Factors team. I thought the facilities outside of we we had to walk a a mile away. I guess that's yeah, for, yeah, yeah. but that's about the thrive and getting your uh, you know getting your exercise. But well, the facilities the, were very very nice as well. Well, and the other thing I really wanted to mention about that is yeah, it was two and a half hours, which I which I do think was a little bit. Over the top, and and of course, part of it was they moved part of it from yesterday, sure. which was unavoidable. But um, but they had a a, a literal well being session in the middle where they had everyone get up and stretch and like I mean that's actually a very considerate thing to do in the middle of a two and a half hour mm. event to stop. You know, I've I've been to a lot of these things where the vendor doesn't stop; they just keep pounding and pounding and pounding. 
and to stop and take a deep breath and have a little fun for a few minutes. I think that sets the right tone. And uh, whether that can translate into software remains to be seen. I think the new leadership team still has a lot to prove. But, you know, this I think we've laid it out pretty much the good, the bad, the ugly, everything pretty much. So you No, know, and I think any customers on, the, on listening to this podcast, that's like anything you do, any projects you have, anything you do. It's, it's hard work. There's good, there's bad. And, and my big thing is just saying, you know, don't just don't just hear the good and believe that that's all it is, and this is some this is some magic unicorn or something. I mean, it's hard work to make it happen, but the software's there. If you get the right people, you have the right the leadership internally to be able to drive the product and the right drive the implementation and the right people. You can have a lot of that success that you saw on the stage there. And if you align with a partner, if you align with a like a partner like Success Factors, and you maximize what they have to offer and you stay on the bleeding edge of what they have, your organization is going to be on the bleeding edge because they are really, they're leading in areas that are, that are cutting edge for most companies, especially when you see that stuff like all that workforce analytics stuff. You know, if you're able to come up and push a few buttons, and again, very difficult to get there, but if you're able to see an HR person very quickly, here's, here's where we're paying females in roles less than males. Here's where, here's where we have attrition at this level. Here's where we have this. Right. That that's the most powerful information for for any organization, and and, and to they me, were demoing some of that. They were that demoing that live on the stage. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see. Well, for those of you who made it to the end, I think we crossed the hour long mark. Uh, I don't know if I'll release in two installments, but it's probably going to be one conversation because it feels like it was a pretty organic conversation. So it's going to be hard to edit it down. But hopefully, you understand a little bit more about Jared's motivations and all this, which is. I always like to dig a little bit at Jared to try to figure out who this guy is all about. Bit of a yep. bit of a and, baffling contradiction. But and, and these aren't scripted either, so I never no, know what's coming until he no, until he until he blurts it out. So. No, no, we didn't. We had no friggin' idea. Anyhow, thanks for joining us. Hope you got something out of it. Thanks for having me, John. <laughs>